Good morning and a very warm welcome and we're doing this recall for November, I, November 2022 INICT. So I think just a month or so back we had done the INICT recall for May 22 and at the beginning of uh, that particular presentation I had put up a slide showing a penalty corner conversion and I can mention that INA is more or less like penalty corners or free kicks that means it's a set piece pattern no? set piece pattern you try to execute that pattern and so many people could relate to that so I'm very happy for it so they were just trying to ask me like uh, what is this what is this fate of INA or what is the future of INA exam now with this next knocking on the doors where are we heading to as far as INA is concerned we have no clues about it but I'm very sure that we'll be having an INA exam and this uh, particular recall session is primarily for those students because the core areas in NEET and INA are not very same so if you ask me whether this is so much a NEET center discussion it's not a NEET center discussion it's an INA center discussion and there are so many people who have wanted to get into central institutes and they understand that in reality it's more easier than NEET because NEET is a very unpredictable exam highly unpredictable from being extraordinary tough in 2020 to very easy in 2021 to mid in 2022 INA always has the same pattern there are no unpredictabilities in INA there are no variations in INA it is a core area that gets tested again and again with some very basic clinical questions so that is why INA is the more easier not to crack and I think if you follow that pattern you will crack there is always a chance after your NEET exam you again have two months if you're willing to put that extra effort and you want to crack INA that's a realistic realistic possibility primarily because the volume that you have to read for INA is very limited it's not that you have to be reading a lot but what is the core to success the crux to success in INI no doubt about it basics because the number of questions that you get from preclinical and paraclinical actually speaking outnumber the questions that you get from clinical in INI it is in direct contrast to NEET where you get a lot of clinical and less of preclinical paraclinical so here maximum questions are preclinical paraclinical but they all have that clinical angle that's why when I read through preclinical, paraclinical questions, I can spot and say this I have taught, this I have taught, this I have taught. Large number of physiology, pathology, pharmacology questions I have taught, not because of my greatness. It is because of the fact that those questions are not just purely physiopatho. They are questions which have a medicine lead. That is why those questions have been asked. I mean, that's why those questions are very important. And that is what we'll be trying to see in retro here. Okay, and every time we have to start off with something, I think this is the time of beginnings and transitions. That is why I have put up Janus. Who is Janus? Janus is uh, a Roman god, you know, Roman god of beginnings and transitions. He's called as um, the god of duality. That means you can see on one side he's looking up front and on another side he's looking back. So there are two heads for Janus. And this is that time of the year. This is that time of the year and that time of your preparation when you are actually having what is called reflections. You're reflecting on your past performances and at the same time that you're looking ahead. So both the things are happening simultaneously. At one point or with one head, you're trying to see what has happened in the last seven, eight months from where you started, where you're right now as a part of the journey, what all performances you have as a backing, how are you giving the GTs, etc., etc. And with one head, you're looking forward and trying to see what is in stock with especially the last three months around for NEET and another couple of months for INI. So I think Janice is the, the right person to actually put. Janice is the god of beginnings and endings. And he's the god of duality. That means duality in the sense like you are two personalities. One personality is to look up front, another personality is to look back. And duality again means he's the god of... Um, beginnings and endings that means beginning of freedom from guilt and endings means end of uh, everything that is negative and also god of war the war that you have in yourself against all those stereotypes that are stacked against you so you're trying to fight against it that is what janus is janus is not a greek god he is a roman god okay and january is named behind janus and we have this janus kainis pathway in endocrine no so that is what may, maybe I think prompted more of more I mean us to maybe learn a little more about Janice. So same theories hold true here as well as far as the exam is concerned, the core areas are concerned and we have discussed that in the previous uh, uh, recall sessions for INICT. There are a lot of recall sessions that we have done and what have we understood? We have discussed all. What have we understood is its core areas. You just have to keep on studying those core areas. Total volume really doesn't matter and basics is the most most important thing. Knowing basics is what differentiates a champion from an average performer. So basics is so very important. So that's again exactly what I have to tell you. I am trying to discuss the clinical questions but more important than discussing the clinical questions is to solve these clinical questions in a 
retro fashion showing you or emphasizing the importance of basics and that is how next is also going to be i'm damn sure about it next is also not going to be like see do i have to study physiology for next means maybe you don't have to study the bigger style but you may have to actually know as to why this happens in this phase of cardiac cycle to answer that question which means you have to be knowing but it's in a different way it's a more clinically oriented way and that is why students who have very sound knowledge of basics are able to eliminate options and come to answers better i have always said you no know, a champion is one who eliminates and finds his way to success it is not about spotting the right answer that is done only for very few number of questions for a champion student who has to get into the top ranks he should be able to eliminate There's so many questions when you see you don't know the answer but how you eliminate your way to success is what defines you and that's exactly what i have always vouched for and please please don't mug up notes just like sitting there and reading notes reading notes mugging up notes that is not the way you should be able to close the angles and mug it up that means closing the angles knowing where it can hit you knowing where it can hit you and going forward that's what differentiates a true champion okay so on that note having seen uh, about roman god janus and about the importance of basics let us get on to the questions and this time around we have a change like every time we have to introduce something new um i feel like otherwise the discussion gets very boring we're not going chapter wise this time we're starting over the basics this time and seeing how medicine understanding helps you to answer basic questions so be quick a recap on that let's see how the basic questions were this is a diagram which i think all of you are familiar with i have discussed this diagram in great detail and you could see that from this very basic diagram and the and the clinical understanding behind this diagram we get four questions this time so i thought of starting with this uh let us start off our discussion and this is a diagram that we discussed under anatomy module in kidney so i told you what is 1 what is 2 what is 3 and 2 plus 3 okay so one is your glomerulus with baumann's capsule glomerulus with baumann's capsule we call it as the renal corpuscle okay we call it as the renal corpuscle two is equal to your pct or proximal convoluted tubule three is equal to proximal straight tubule three is equal to proximal straight tubule which we also call as the pars recta okay and we also call it as segment 3 s3 segment of the proximal tubule okay s3 segment of the proximal tubule proximal straight tubule or pars recta and that is this number 3 okay 2 plus 3 is together what we call proximal tubule proximal convoluted plus proximal straight tubule together what we call proximal tubule this 2 plus 3 proximal tubule i told you very important to go back and see the importance of 3 because 3 is situated in the medulla it is not in the cortex that is why whenever you are having acute tubular necrosis or acute tubular injury which we call it because actually there is no necrosis it is the proximal straight tubule that gets affected max okay this you know then i told you 4 5 and 4 plus 5 What is four, five, and four plus five? Thin descending limb of loop of Henle is called four. Thin ascending limb of loop of Henle is called five. And when you add a four plus five, we get intermediate tubule. So proximal tubule, now intermediate tubule. That is four plus five. Okay. Then we have discussed what is six, eight, and six plus eight. Okay. So two, three, two plus three, four, five, four plus five, six, eight, and six plus eight. Six is your thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, what we call thal, and that is also called distal straight tubule so this is called thal or distal straight tubule then we have 8 equal to distal convoluted tubule so 6 and 8 it is called distal convoluted tubule 6 plus 8 is called dst plus dt distal straight plus distal convoluted tubule which is called distal tubule or dt distal tubule or dt okay so we have 2 plus 3 4 plus 5 6 plus 8 2 plus 3 is proximal tubule 4 plus 5 is intermediate tubule 6 plus 8 is called distal tubule this is together called as the excretory part of the kidney correct all this we have studied in detail and anatomy also you have studied 2 plus 3 4 plus 5 6 plus 8 called excretory part of the kidney okay then we have a collecting part from 9 onwards that's a separate discussion which you've done in nephrology so this much you know now the question is about 7 here what is 7 okay 7 is your macula densa so 7 is your macula densa which are tall columnar cells okay tall columnar cells and their function is a physiology thing what we call tubular glomerular feedback which i have discussed in great detail and that's not the question here so we're not going to that and this is part of your juxta glomerular apparatus juxta glomerular apparatus last i in the question was macula densa is not a part of was a question 
So that was last I in a question, not a part of that's why I'm saying same area gets repeated with the question changes. Not a part of DCT, DST, uh, TAL, and DT. These were the four options: DCT, DST, TAL, and DT. Many questions got many students got it wrong last time. So, what are they trying to test you? Where you whether you know the anatomy of the macular densa. The macular densa, I've told very clearly, is actually seen in the cortical portion of the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. So it is in the cortical portion of the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, which means that TAL is a correct answer here. TAL is otherwise called DST, so that's also correct here. DT is actually DST plus DCT, so that's also correct. So macular densa is part of DST, TAL and DT is right. And macular densa is not a part of the answer is DCT. So DCT was the answer to that question, which we've discussed in the last recap. Okay, this time they just changed that question one person and asked us to macular densa is located at the junction of. So macular densa is located at the junction of means you can say that it is 7 and 7 is between 6 and 8. Okay, what is 6? Six? 6 is thal and what is 8? Eight? 8 is DCT. So the answer is at the junction of thal and DCT. This is DCT, this is thal, it is between thal and DCT. So same diagram, same concept, same anatomy. Just that question changed to one percent. So that's why this diagram is so important. Please go back and see the discussion on this diagram. From the single diagram in INACT, four questions have come. You can study from anatomy, but when you study from nephrology, that core idea also comes. Now the TG feedback comes in. A lot of clinical things comes in. Come in, so it actually stays more better. Okay. So that is the first question. So location of macular densa between thal and DCT. Thal is also called DST. Now. Second question, what is the effect of ADH on PCT reabsorption? I mean, this is so much so an important question and I have discussed this in great detail. Let us see in a nutshell again what happens. Where have we discussed this? This we have discussed when we have opened our discussion on hyponatremia. The first thing I told you about hyponatremia, which every MBB student in the country should be knowing is, hyponatremia and hypernatremia have nothing to do with sodium. They are disorders of water metabolism. During our times, we were told that if you don't know this, you better run away. Because if you think hyponatremia is sodium, that means your understanding is zero. Okay. So when it is a disorder of water metabolism, you should be knowing how water is being reabsorbed. Correct. How water is being reabsorbed. Water is being reabsorbed from two sources. Predominantly from the PCT and then from the cortical collecting duct. So predominantly PCT, then cortical collecting duct. PCT reabsorption of water is independent of ADH. It is independent of ADH. That's why it is called as obligatory water reabsorption. So it is independent of ADH. It is called obligatory water reabsorption. But aquaporins are there. It is aquaporin 1 that is there. Okay. When you look at the cortical collecting duct water reabsorption, it is ADH dependent water reabsorption. Yes. Because it is ADH dependent water reabsorption, it is called facultative water reabsorption. Facultative water reabsorption. And you know that it is aquaporin 2, which is on the luminal membrane. Okay, and aquaporin 3 and 4, which are on the basolateral membrane. So, aquaporin 3 and 4 on the basolateral membrane, aquaporin 2 on the luminal membrane. Correct. And this ADH here acts via which receptor? V2 receptor. And V2 receptor acts via cyclic AMP pathway or cyclic AMP protein kinase A path. All this I have discussed in great detail. And what is that I have told you before we discussed hyponatremia is why is that a normal person doesn't develop hyponatremia? Okay, why is that a normal person doesn't develop hyponatremia? There are three reasons, but two very, very important reasons. The two very important reasons why a normal person doesn't develop hyponatremia is the PCT reabsorption is isosmotic. Okay, PCT reabsorption, all the salt and water are reabsorbed, it is isosmotic. That means if you look at the osmolality of the fluid entering the PCT, it is 285 to 290. The osmolality of the fluid leaving the PCT is also 285 to 290. There is no change. And the blood osmolality is 285 to 290. Urine osmolality by the time you excrete is 800 to 900. That's a different story. And there are so many players, counter current multiplication, exchange and all that. But in the PCT, there is no change. That means the reabsorption happening at the level of the PCT is isoosmotic. Correct. And the second reason I told you, ADH in your blood in the resting state is negligible. Okay, ADH in your blood in the resting state is negligible. And third, your thick ascending limb of loop of Henle doesn't reabsorb water. It is only solute reabsorption that happens there. These are the three reasons why you generally don't get hyponatremia. And I told you how these reasons breach and how you get hyponatremia and all these things. Now, if you look at the question that they have asked here, this is the question. What is the effect of ADH on PCT reabsorption? And the effect of ADH on PCT reabsorption is nil. 
that is why the fluid coming out of the PCD, that was the question that they framed, is going to be isoosmotic. There is no change. It is going to be 285 to 290 itself. Simple, very, very simple question. Okay, but if you don't know the concept, again, you can be foxed by the options. That is question number two. Question number three was a simple pharmacology question. They, try, they gave the same thing and you have to actually mark the site of action of your different diuretics. And I have told you that this is your PCT and this again has been discussed in great detail by our own Ranjan sir who gives a lot of clinical understanding. So, that's why his videos are gold. Okay, so PCT is again equal to acetosolamide. That is what they ask for the exam. Then you have the 6 or thal where your loop diuretics act including frosimide, bumethanide, ethacrinic acid of which we are using frosimide and torsimide only in clinical practice. 8 is your DCT where you have your sodium chloride symporter where you have the thiazide diuretics acting of which currently we are using hydrochlorothiazide, chlorthalidone, indepamide and metalazone. That's what we are using. So these were the other options and ADH acts at the level of the cortical collecting duct. We don't have any name for the cell on which ADH acts. Whereas aldosterone, we call it as a P cell or the principal cell. Whereas ADH, we don't call it by any name. So it's a very simple question. That question, most of the students could get it right without any problem. First two questions, some students got it wrong. Renal protective drug in albuminuria acting on the PC. This is a tough question. Okay, but again, if you've discussed nephrology, seen the nephrology videos, you can know. To actually uh, decrease albuminuria, our main option is AC inhibitor bar ARB. That is our main, main option. Second option that we have is your SDLT2 inhibitor. And third option is your aldosterone antagonist. These are the three options that we have. Correct. AC inhibitor ARB, not what I'm going to discuss now, SDLT2 inhibitor. What does an SDLT2 inhibitor do? Or what does it do? SDLT2 inhibitors, that is your canaglyphosin, dapaglyphosin, and your empaglyphosin. These are the approved SDLT2 inhibitors. They are called renoprotective because they block this SDLT2 receptor. When they block SCLT2 receptor, you have natriuresis, at the same time you have diuresis and no tachycardia. That's what makes them really great, okay. Natriuresis, diuresis, no tachycardia. And they will increase the solute load to the macular densa. They will increase the solute load to the macular densa. When they increase the solute load, because sodium is not being reabsorbed, what will happen? When you are having more solute load to the macular densa, what happens? When you are having more solute load to the macular densa, you have afferent arterial constriction. Correct. Afferent arterial dilatation, when you are having less solute load, afferent arterial constriction, when you are having more solute load. That is called tubular glomerular feedback. Afferent arterial constriction means that will decrease the glomerular hyperfiltration. The main problem in any kidney disease is glomerular hyperfiltration. Now, if you look at the GFR of a normal person, that is equal to his number of nephrons into single nephron GFR, correct? Single nephron GFR into number of nephrons. Due to some disease, when the number of nephrons decreases, whether it be diabetes or whatever it is, number of nephrons decreases, then your single nephron GFR will increase, correct? Single nephron GFR increase will lead on to hyperfiltration injury. That is called hyperfiltration that leads on to injury. This hyperfiltration leading on to injuries because whenever you are having single nephron GFR increasing, more blood to that nephron, more hyperfiltration, capillary pore diameter increases or alters, more proteins will leak and more proteins will cause more tubular injury, more interstitial inflammation, DJ beta fibrosis. So that is why hyperfiltration is the main point here. That is what is leading on to proteinuria. So when you are actually kind of constricting the afferent arteriole, glomerular hyperfiltration decreases. Because afferent arterial is now constricted. That is why renoprotective drug acting on the PCT, inhibiting sodium independent glucose transporter 2, very important answer is STLT2 inhibitor. Simple question. Okay, so this has got nothing to do with ACE inhibitor ARB, nothing to do with aldosterone antagonist. Drug acting on the PCT itself, many people were able to make out the answer because where is the STLT2 receptor? It is on the PCT. Okay, so when you think of the PCT itself, don't ever go wrong. This is a PCT cell, this is a PCT cell. Now, between the two PCT cells, you have this paracellular mode of transport. That is the bulk through which water, sodium, calcium, everybody is going inside. Okay. Then we have something called secondary active transport. Secondary active transport is sodium-dependent phosphorus transport, sodium-dependent glucose transport, sodium-dependent amino acid transport. Correct. The sodium dependent phosphorus transport, sodium dependent glucose transport, sodium dependent amino acid transport. The sodium dependent glucose transporter is what we call SDLT2. Correct. And this is 
there then we have another thing called sodium hydrogen exchange okay and this sodium hydrogen exchange is very important because this h plus will combine with the hco3 minus that is being filtered to form h2co3 and h2co3 will break down into h2 and co2 the co2 will easily diffuse inside combine with water to form h2co3 and this h2co3 will again split up into h plus which will be secreted out hco3 minus which is again reabsorbed this is how bicarbonate is being reabsorbed this is what happens in the pct okay this we have discussed in detail in endo in nephro so many places we have discussed okay let's go back and see so there are four questions from here if your understanding is good you will score four marks here not 16 marks in anatomy here but essentially the core is nephro but if you know anatomy you can answer but if you know the clinical side of it, it's very easy to answer okay these are the first four questions next question is actually a biochemistry question which i have discussed that is the urine order okay in our urine analysis discussion we have actually had a table like this and i have told you in detail about urine order let us see what is the question they asked the question they asked is burnt sugar smell of urine okay burnt sugar smell of urine burnt sugar smell of urine i mentioned very clearly is due to maple syrup urine disease okay maple syrup urine disease this burnt sugar smell of urine now this burnt sugar smell of urine is basically uh, almost like a maple syrup order i don't know what is maple syrup order like a curry order or a burnt sugar order okay the enzyme defect is always branch chain amino acids there that is your valine leucine isoleucine branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase or branch chain keto acid decarboxylase is the defect in that That's a simple question mousy order or musty order is phenylalanine hydroxylase defect that is called phenyl ketonuria which everybody knows okay sweaty feet order sweaty feet order is isovaleric acidemia this again we've discussed in the table it's a very important question tyrosinemia where you get cabbage order okay fumarole acetoacetate hydroxylase is the enzyme defect in type 1 tyrosine transaminase is the enzyme defect in type 2 hawkins urea is type 3 where you get a swimming pool order okay all these things have come for the exam so many times you can mug it up from biochemistry you can study it from urine analysis but when you study from urine analysis i feel the wholesome understanding comes a little bit so again if you know this it's very simple basic question but again a basic question which is centered on medicine understanding that's why please don't see medicine videos as just those questions which are coming from medicine it is the wholesome understanding when i started doing the video my understand then there were 300 questions for the exam that's what i have envisaged and that's what i always want if you just watch medicine videos you should be able to answer 125 out of 300 that's what i am aiming for in a 200 question paper probably uh, a little less because we are only 200 questions so maybe 80 85 questions and i think it will happen okay now next question is another basic question is again from biochemistry that is glycosylated hemoglobin versus fructosamine the question this time was on what is fructosamine so the best control for the last six to eight weeks of your blood sugar control is best assessed by your hba1c okay best assessed by your hba1c and this has got lot of value especially in people who are having impaired glucose tolerance yes lot of value in people who are having impaired glucose tolerance less than 5.7 5.7 6.4 and more than or equal to 6.5 okay that's it now the problem with hba1c so what's the problem in uh, hba1c you can get falsely low hba1c or you can get falsely high hba1c okay falsely low hba1c so many things you can see over here but two catch questions for the exam hemolytic anemia chronic liver disease hemolytic anemia chronic liver disease i would say pregnancy also but it's not been asked hemolytic anemia chronic liver disease you can get falsely low hba1c where can you get falsely high HbA1c? Hypertriglyceridemia, iron deficiency anemia, and renal failure. So, hypertriglyceridemia, iron deficiency anemia, renal failure. Three settings where you can get falsely high HbA1c. And hemoglobinopathies. Okay, hemoglobinopathies where it can be low or high. So, there is no particular thing. Low or high, it can be in hemoglobinopathies. Hemolytic anemia is better like falsely low. So, that's why even if you get a question on a hemoglobinopathy, low or high, but better answer is low. And elevated hypertriglyceridemia, iron deficiency anemia, renal failure. So, when you can't use that, then you have something called fructosamine that I have told you. But what is fructosamine was the question. And that is based on the simple diagram. Yes, when glucose combines with RBC, it is hemoglobin inside the RBC, we get HbA1c. When it combines with albumin and other glycated proteins, we get fructosamine. The major component of fructosamine is glycated albumin. So, when it combines with albumin, you get this. And the major component is glycated albumin, which we have stressed on so many number of times. So, it is hemoglobin in the RBC and albumin outside. When you combine with albumin, you get fructosamine. And the same question they ask for the exam also. Okay. 
So please, please, please have a good idea on this. And all these things can actually alter your HbA1c. Most important things that can alter your HbA1c, once again, iron deficiency anemia and even aplastic anemia, also anemias. Then chronic liver disease, hemolytic anemias, pregnancy, hemoglobinopathies. That is the next biochemistry question. From there, we go to biochemistry 3, glue transporters. This is so important for a medicine person, the pathogenesis of diabetes. Every time I have been stressing so much on GLUT4. And I think everybody who knows, goes for the exam knows this. GLUT4 is seen in cardiac, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. And this whole theory of lipolysis. What did I tell you? When you are having abdominal obesity, you are having excess lipolysis. Because alpha receptors in the abdomen change over to beta 3 receptors. When you are having lipolysis, lipolysis leads on to free fatty acid formation. And insulin generally inhibits lipolysis. When you are having insulin resistance, this is surmounted. Free fatty acids are straight going into the portal blood and they go to the liver. That's why abdominal obesity is dangerous. Gluteal obesity is not dangerous because it doesn't go straight to the liver. And in the liver, free fatty acids cannot enter the mitochondria because carnitine palmitotransferase is not expressed. When it is not expressed, these free fatty acids form fatty acyl CoA. And that contributes to further insulin resistance. So it's like a vicious cycle. We have discussed that in detail. The other glue transporters I have discussed, Rebecca Madam has discussed. STLT1, I have told you about hereditary glucose, characters, malabsorption, malabsorption syndrome. STLT2, we just discussed now. So it's lots to learn there. Again, if you learn it wholesome, that's always going to be of advantage. Okay, now next question. Again, biochemistry question, but medicine. So elevated homocysteine. Normal methyl malonic acid, okay. Normal methyl malonic acid and megaloblastic anemia is present. So, megaloblastic anemia can be due to folate deficiency, it can be due to vitamin B12 deficiency, okay. It can be due to vitamin B12 deficiency, okay. Now, if you actually see for the only two reactions which require vitamin B12 in the body, one is homocysteine to methionine, okay, which is part of the folate trap. Correct. And then methyl melanyl coa to succinyl coa. Okay. Methyl melanyl coa to succinyl coa. And what have we discussed? If you are having a B12 deficiency, your methyl melanyl coa cannot be converted into succinyl coa. And methyl melanyl coenzyme A level in blood and urine increases, and we look for it in urine. And homocysteine will not be converted into methionine. So, homocysteine level also increases. Here, you are having normal methanol melanic acid level. So, that is not applicable. When you are having a folate deficiency, which is that reaction in folate that is linked to B12, that is homocysteine to methionine. So, folate deficiency, homocysteine is not getting converted into methionine. Because 5 methyl THFA has to be converted into THFA. That is the whole story. And we have discussed the whole diagram. But methyl melanyl coenzyme A to succinyl coenzyme A is not related to what? Not related to your folic acid. So, this is a case of folate deficiency. Simple. Methyl melanyl CoA as well as homocysteine increasing is B12 deficiency. Only homocysteine increasing methyl melanyl CoA normal is equal to folic acid deficiency. And what are the other permutation combinations possible inside that? We have done a detailed discussion on microplastic anemia. Please go and watch that. And the levels, how you interpret the levels in case you get a more tougher question, everything. Okay. So, beta oxidation of all these fatty acids produce Acetyl coenzyme A, except for these odd chain fatty acids, etc. This acetyl coenzyme A has to be converted into melanyl coenzyme A. It's a carboxylation reaction which requires biotin. Same way we have propionyl coenzyme A from odd chain fatty acid metabolism. This propionyl coenzyme A has to be converted into methyl melanyl coenzyme A. And this methyl melanyl coenzyme A, again, this requires what? Biotin. Methyl melanyl coenzyme A has to be converted into succinyl coenzyme A. That is what requires B12. Okay, and succinyl coenzyme is succinyl fumarate, malate, oxaloacetate, and TCA cycle. Okay, so that is how closely these subjects are related. You shouldn't think them as independent entities. Anatomy 2 is based on this bronchopulmonary segment distribution. Now, it's a very, very important anatomy understanding, but very important for the clinical person also. In the intro part, I have told you this. And the question asked for the exam was, most common bronchopulmonary segment involved by aspiration in supine position and most common bronchopulmonary segment involved by aspiration in erect position. And in both, we have discussed so many times. Most common bronchopulmonary, right lung is definitely involved more by aspiration because it is right bronchus is short, it is wider and it is more vertical. So, shorter, wider and vertical. That's why right lung always. Right lung has how many bronchopulmonary segments? 10 bronchopulmonary segments. How many lobes? 3 lobes. So, we have apical, we have anterior 
and we have posterior that is in the right upper lobe. Then we have medial and lateral in the right middle lobe. Then we have superior, then medial basal, lateral basal, anterior basal, posterior basal where in the lower lobe. So total 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 BPS. Most common BPS involved in the erect portion is the postrobasal segment of the right lower lobe. Okay, postrobasal segment of the right lower lobe. So I have said so many times, right? When you look at the supine position, then it is the superior segment of the right lower lobe. Superior segment of the right lower lobe, followed by posterior segment of the right upper lobe. So, superior segment of the right lower lobe followed by posterior segment of the right upper lobe. So, this you can study from anatomy, but in our discussion, basic lung anatomy discussion, we have discussed this where we have plumbed this to so many other factors also. What is primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, what happens in a small airway disease, what happens here, there, etc. Everything we have discussed. Okay, that's what this is. Anatomy 3, identifying the cell. I think this shouldn't be a problem at all for anyone because we discussed that in detail. We see the slides. Clara cells are seen in the bronchiole, like I have told you everything about this. Dust cells are the other name for pulmonary alveolar macrophages. Parietal cells are your acid secreting cells as well as intrinsic factor which you see in the stomach and copper cells of course in the liver which are macrophages. Okay, this was identifying, this is a very very easy question. Inside that the anatomy part that we have discussed, conducting airways have different cells, the same slide. Basal cells are the stem cells, goblet cells are the ones which actually secrete. Mucus, dash cells are non-ciliated cuboidal epithelial cells in the terminal bronchioles. They are involved in detoxification and they are a progenitor for bronchiolar cells. Same thing, these are the clara or the club cells. Dash cells are characterized by dense core vesicles which contain serotonin, calcitonin, CGRP, Kulshitsky cells. Same thing we have discussed. Okay. Now. And between trachea, bronchus and bronchial, what are the differences? What is conducting zone? All those things. Now, this is a very interesting thing. The same thing came for the exam. I was uh, trying to, helping you to identify because we are discussing all the anatomy of the lung. Celia, everything we are discussing. And two disorders with respect to celia. One is your cartaginous zone. So, after discussing cartaginous zone, then I am going to the next disease. There I have told you about this disease. Same slides. Celia, normal but thickened secretions. Bronchi, biliary tract, intestine, reproductive system. So, then itself, you know, it's a stick fibrosis. CFTR gene, 7Q, okay. Autosomal recessive, chloride ion defect, F508 mutation, phenylalanine hydroxylase is the defective enzyme. And chloride channel opener used in its treatment. And we have seen this chloride channel opener called Ivacaftor. And I think Krishna Kumar has also taught you Ivacaftor. I have also taught you Ivacaftor. And Krishna Kumar has also discussed the same, same order. That means celia, then dianinum defective, what we call as cartagenous, and then this thing. And now, for this year's exam, we have the same question. F508 mutation because of phenyl and hydroxylase. Rebecca Madam has taught you, Singaram has taught you, I have taught you, and Krishna Kumar has also taught you. So, four people have taught you this. Please, I think, I think all of you would have got it right. But that's the importance of clubbing everything and studying. There's no single subject concept. There is just studying for the entrance, okay? So, from wherever you get it, it is a bonus. But I'm trying to tell you how importantly medicine is linked to these basic subjects. Okay. Now, next one. Coinard segments of the liver. Coinard segments of the liver has been asked as a part of a radiology question. And I have discussed coinard segments of the liver. Rohan sir has also discussed coinard segments of the liver. But again, for you to pick it up at that point, see, that is the important thing. If you draw your liver like this, what you understand is that this is based on the middle hepatic vein. So we have the middle hepatic vein, we have the right hepatic vein, we have the left hepatic vein. The middle hepatic vein, the right hepatic vein, as well as the left hepatic vein all come and join to the IVC, okay? But it is across this middle hepatic vein that we are having what? We are having something called the uh, cantilus line, no? Between the gallbladder fossa and the IVC. And then the portal vein comes from here, right? The portal vein comes from here. The portal vein divides into right and left. So, we can actually draw like this, fine? And you start naming from here in a clockwise direction. Start naming from here in a clockwise direction. One, two, three, four. 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And they have actually asked for in the exam 8. A very simple question. Okay. So, this is the surgical lobes of the liver. I have discussed this in liver anatomy. You can actually go back and see that same diagram we have shown. And they may have asked you to identify this with respect to an image. Simple question. 
So you can study from anatomy, surgery, medicine, wherever you want. Okay, this is what I showed you. Okay, now two more questions. This we have discussed under peripheral neuropathy. So incorrected cause of peripheral neuropathy. Most of the time we talk about Charcot Marie Tooth disease. Then two disease conditions I told you, and I told you they are linked to biochemistry. You get the question in biochemistry as well as in medicine, in neurology, and peripheral neuropathy. ATP binding acid protein is defective. So that is the one that is used to take out the bad cholesterol from the tissue. So it's an autosomal recessive disease. And so bad cholesterol doesn't go from the tissue. So HDL is low. Asymmetric mononeuropathy with orange tonsil. This is what we call as your tangious disease. When you hear orange tonsil itself, you know tangious disease. Reduced HDL and all the other details I've discussed alongside in lipid. We did a module in addition 5 for lipid. Or we can actually see it with peripheral neuropathy. Similarly, axonal degeneration. Peripheral neuropathy plus retinitis pigmentosa plus cerebellar ataxia. This is the triad. This is called your famous Refsum's disease, which is characterized by defect in branch chain fatty acid alpha oxidation, which happens in the peroxisomes. Okay, this peroxisome I have not said. Okay, peroxisome, branch chain fatty acid alpha oxidation. Alpha oxidation, beta oxidation, omega oxidation, all those. But just see two things which biochemistry has, ma'am, has taught you. But you can see the clinical angle. And the clinical side, you will study this automatically. So if you know the clinical part, you see the question, it becomes very, very easy. But otherwise, you will have to mug up this whole thing. Okay. And I told you how Refsum's is a axonal neuropathy with a triad, RP, cerebellar ataxia, and your neuropathy. And asymmetric mononeuropathy with orange tonsil and ATP binding acid protein defective is your tangious disease. Again, two more questions from biochemistry, which are very much linked to medicine. Okay. Pharmacology was actually speaking medicine everywhere. They just, I mean, all the questions will be discussed by me and Rajat sir, and you have your wish fill and mercy, you can see it from anywhere. Very simple questions. Dash HIV drug produces hyperpigmentation, emtricitabine, straightforward question. Step number five, they asked you, that is this integration. Integrase inhibitors, your raltigravir, Dorutigravir, which we have mentioned in great detail. Anti TB drugs, mechanism of action, bedaquilin, ATP synthase inhibitor, INH, mycolic acid synthesis inhibitor, and rifampicin, they told you is an enzyme inhibitor, it's an enzyme inducer. Yes. G6PD table in hematology class, I have shown you, sir has discussed, and this time it is primaquin. Artisanate sulfadoxim is used in the treatment of malaria. Simple question. Anti CD20 monoclonal antibody rituximab and Thousands of things you discussed on rituximab. DPP4 safe and renal failure, I think this question has come so many times already. It is linagliptin. Imatinib is your BCR ABL tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Sirolimus is your mTOR inhibitor. We discussed this so many times. Infliximab is your anti TNF alpha. Transducimab is your HER2 news. So, this again has come so many times. PPR alpha agonist, which is used in the treatment of hyperlipidemia, producing gallstones. I have told you this thousand times. PPR gamma agonist is there. PPR alpha agonist is there, PPR alpha gamma dual agonist is there. PPR alpha agonist is your clofibrate, which is used in hypertriglyceridemia. PPR gamma agonist is your pyoglitazone, which is a thiazolin dione, which is used in diabetes, not very popular now, now being used again in a bigger way in fatty liver. And dual PPR alpha gamma agonist is called saroglitazar. And saroglitazar is the drug of choice for diabetic dyslipidemia due to so many reasons. And the main issue with clofibrate is that it produces gallstones. It can also produce rhabdomyolysis. All these things we have discussed. Sir has also taught very easy. Pharmacology was very simple, straight, very simple, straight. I think all the questions you would have been able to answer. All this matched and all these things we've seen. One or two interesting pharmacology questions. Hypertensive patient with a potassium of higher range, very higher range, 6.5. Sodium high, potassium, urea, creatinine, 3.8. So what drug should be stopped? So this is very simple. Patient has a creatinine 3.8. We have not mentioned whether it is AK or CKD or whatever. Potassium is also on the higher side. You just assume that if the patient has bilateral RAS and you have given him ACE inhibitor or ARB, that will increase the creatinine, that will increase the potassium. Correct? So, obviously, when you don't know any detail, you have to think like this. So, first drug I will stop will be Losart. There is no detail given in the question. I will just assume that, okay, this is what it is. Okay. Too much of thought process not required because too much of detail is not there in the question. All the following side effects are more commonly seen with carbamazepine than oxcarbamazepine. It's a very important statement. I told you, oxcarb is superior to carbamazepine in every way you look at it. But when we discuss hyponatremia, 
we saw SIDH, correct? We saw SIDH. And in SIDH, we saw the 5 C's producing SIDH, the 5 C's, okay? One is chlorpropamide, then cyclophosphamide, chlorfibrate, chlorpromacin, and carbamazepine. Okay, and what did I tell you? All the side effects are actually who is superior? Oxcarb is superior. But there is one side effect which is actually speaking one where carbamazepine is superior because oxcarb produces more and that is SIDH and that is hyponatremia. So all are more commonly seen with carbamazepine except for SIDH which is more commonly seen with oxcarbamazepine which Ranjan sir has also mentioned, I have also mentioned. Okay, these are all questions that we have discussed and if you have seen through the video and have actually read through the notes, your notes or marrow notes, I think it won't be a problem, it wouldn't be a problem. But your understanding is not good enough. I mean, who can help that? Only you can help that. TH1, TH2, TH17 pathways again. I have discussed this because I told you that RA is a predominantly TH1 mediated disease, SLE is a predominantly TH2 mediated disease. What is seen in TH1? Interleukin 12, interferon gamma, interleukin 2 and TNF alpha. All this you've seen. Interleukin 4, interleukin 5, interleukin 13. This is part of your TH2. And interleukin 17, interleukin 22, part of your TH17. And the question they asked this time was interleukin 2 or interferon gamma. It's part of your TH1. Actually, this naive T cell to differentiate into TH1, it requires interleukin 12. That is where more of interleukin 12 is required. One, once it becomes a TH1, it produces interleukin 2 and interferon gamma. Interferon gamma acts on your macrophage and macrophage produces TNF alpha. And you can see the sequence in RA, rheumatoid arthritis, that I have discussed this. Okay, again patho, again medicine. So, next is a micro question, but I wanted to discuss this. Parvo related disease population pairs. So, what have I taught you about parvo? Erythema infectiosum parvo produces an infant, Singara mestotti, and everybody knows this. Non immune hydrocytalis in pregnant woman, again, everybody knows this. And the same question came for both the sessions. And if you have actually listened to the videos, what have we discussed? Every compensated chronic hemolytic anemia, like hereditary spherocytosis, etc., goes on very, very well. Only problem that they can have is they can have a aplastic crisis, correct? And when do they get this aplastic crisis? They get this aplastic crisis when they have a parvo infection, okay? They have a parvo infection. And we have another disease called pure red cell aplasia, okay? Which is very much linked to parvovirus. So, when you get a parvo infection, a hemolytic anemia, you can get an aplastic crisis. PRC is linked to parvo infection. So, that's a very easy pick. And about parvo and rheumatology. This is a very important statement that I have made. What did I tell you? We have acute inflammatory monoarthritis. We have acute inflammatory polyarthritis. We have chronic inflammatory monoarthritis and chronic inflammatory polyarthritis. In approach to arthritis, you can see this. Six weeks is the cutoff. The moment you are having chronic inflammatory polyarthritis, then RA will come to mind, SLE and all the associated SLE things will come to mind and all that will come to mind. So, radiatic arthritis, you know, everything will come to mind. So, it's a very easy pick. Acute inflammatory monoarthritis is again crystal versus septic arthritis. This I have told you so many times. And crystal is mostly gout or pseudo gout. This also we have discussed. And there I told you, there is something called acute inflammatory polyarthritis, less than 6 weeks. There, the major confusion is whether it is undifferentiated arthritis, which will become RA tomorrow, or is it a viral arthritis. And which is the viral arthritis that behaves just like RA? I told you so many times, it is parvovirus that behaves just like RA. So, when you see a patient with acute inflammatory polyarthritis inside 6 weeks, it is very difficult. You may have to wait for 6 weeks to see whether it is becoming chronic or it is going away. If it is going away, it is viral. If it is not going away, it is mostly RA. And chikungunya is the only virus that can produce persistent chronic arthritis. That is acute, that is inflammatory polyarthritis. Others and all go within 6 weeks. And how many cases of undifferentiated arthritis will go into RA? One third of them will go into RA. So, if you now see this option, Polymyalgia rheumatica and young woman. That's a totally wrong thing. Polymyalgia rheumatica, first of all, its relationship with paro, nothing like that. Young woman, again, no relationship. Okay. Polymyalgia rheumatica is seen above 50 years. It is seen in association with giant cell arthritis. That is where we study. Giant cell arthritis, PMR syndrome is what it is called. And it is characterized by what? It is characterized by early morning stiffness. Okay. Early morning stiffness of the hip shoulder pelvic girdle okay hip shoulder pelvic girdle and what did i tell you 
it is not actually an arthritis it is more of a myositis okay it is not an arthritis it is more of a myositis and second is esr high third is its brilliant response to low dose steroids so and gc is a disease that you see only above 50 years with a female male ratio to so if you know this this is definitely wrong it's clubbing microbial medicine okay fine easy question next one sars can be covid that's we've done this covid module in the last edition everybody knows antigen test everybody knows pcr everybody knows elisa there is nothing called southern blotting here which madam has also mentioned that time i have also mentioned the simple question it is ebv ayyo we've done revision we've done module on ebv itself okay ebv receptor is cd21 and disease associated with ebv please please go back and study there are a big list of disease i'm not going to that again please study everything is important in that percentage wise i have told you okay please see b cell lymphomas t cell lymphomas this that etc everything is important okay everything is important and please again and again asked post transplant lymphomas okay very important and is hodgkin's disease with respect to mixed cellularity with respect to lymphocyte depleted with respect to lymphocyte rich with respect to nodular sclerosis and it is not seen in nodular lymphocyte predominant okay second to test out and these are core areas krishna kumar zone what does zero pressure indicate in the pressure volume curve again we have discussed it is a pressure at which the tendency of the alveoli to collapse volume at which tendency of the alveoli to collapse is exactly equal to the tendency of the chest wall to expand that means at the end of normal expiration how much air is left in the alveoli residual volume which whatever you do you cannot breathe out expired reserve volume which if you take some effort you can breathe out that is called functional residual capacity and it is at this level that your tendency of the lung to expand sorry collapse is equally counterbalanced by the tendency of the chest wall to expand you can see the graph and vector going here there etc in the video please go back and watch that it is frc okay daily insensible water loss this is another question okay now this is a little little tricky question because i don't know whether they ask the water loss per 100 kilo calorie per day okay this is one answer so insensible water loss per 100 kilo calorie per day insensible water loss per 100 kilo calorie per day is 45 ml okay so insensible water loss per 100 kilo calorie per day is equal to 45 ml but if you are asking very broadly what is insensible water loss then it is 900 ml lungs 300 ml six, six, skin 600 ml that's why even if you are having a ckd end stage renal disease patient whose kidney is not working and advise don't drink water don't drink water don't drink water till still then we ask him to still we ask him to drink approximately 800 to 900 because that is the insensible water loss so insensible water loss answer is 900 ml if they have asked per 100 kilo calorie the answer is 45 ml so some people told me 50 ml and all were there in the options so 50 ml cannot be the answer if they are asking just ml if they are asking just ml it is 900 ml and if it is per 100 kilo calorie it is 45 ml okay that's it there is another physiology question where they had some confusion and this we have discussed again in hyponatremia i haven't told this this i have not taught you this part i have taught you. okay then this question ongotic pressure this question i am little confused because i don't know whether they mentioned a normal capillary ongotic pressure or they actually mentioned the uh, glomerular capillary oncotic pressure so that is the confusion i am having some of them are saying it's normal capillary some of them are saying it's what glomerular so anyway let's see for a normal capillary normal capillary we have hydrostatic pressure we have oncotic pressure correct arterial length we have venous end we have arterial length of the capillary hydrostatic pressure is 33 mm of mercury 33 mm of mercury it's trying to take out fluid okay venous end it is 13 mm of mercury so 33 here 13 here okay when you look at the oncotic pressure okay oncotic pressure oncotic pressure there is a slight difference blood is there tissue fluid is there or interstitial oncotic pressure is there blood oncotic pressure is trying to retain fluid in the capillary okay and tissue oncotic pressure is trying to push out fluid in the cap from the capillary okay so when you try to see for the blood oncotic pressure is generally 28 mm of mercury some books say 25 but guidance says 28 so we'll go with 28 okay 28 and tissue oncotic pressure is 8 mm of mercury so 8 mm of mercury okay so what is the net oncotic pressure it should be 28 minus 8 which should be 20 mm of mercury 20 mm of mercury 
okay that is why you have to be knowing at the arterial end at the venous end arterial end your net hydrostatic pressure is 33 millimeters of mercury net oncotic pressure is 28 minus 8 that is 20 millimeters of mercury venous end hydrostatic pressure is 13 millimeters of mercury 10 plus 3 there it was 30 plus 3 and oncotic pressure is still the same it is 20 millimeters of mercury correct that is why at the arterial end hydrostatic pressure exceeds the oncotic pressure by 13 millimeters or net filtration is 13 millimeters of mercury going out okay net filtration pressure 13 millimeters going out at the venous end it is minus 7 millimeters of mercury why is minus because it is going in okay in so if they have asked what is the value of oncotic pressure of the tissue minus oncotic pressure of the blood so oncotic pressure of the tissue is equal to 8 millimeters of mercury oncotic pressure of the blood is equal to 28 millimeters of mercury so the net oncotic pressure is actually speaking 20 millimeters of mercury net is 20 because 8 is trying to go out and 28 is trying to take it in so the answer should be 20 there is no option like 20 if you look at gano this value instead of 28 in gano is mentioned as 25 okay 25 so then if you take it as 25 minus 8 then it becomes 17 millimeters of mercury so that is also not there in the option 17 is also not there so i think it may be 28 minus 8 20 so i'll mark this now why i am interested in this is because we are having our own nephrology where we are looking into gfr which is equal to net ultrafiltration pressure into ultrafiltration coefficient ultrafiltration coefficient is 12.5 ml per minute per mm mercury net ultrafiltration pressure is equal to net hydrostatic pressure minus net oncotic pressure okay and here it is yeah net oncotic pressure is 32 millimeters of mercury here okay 32 millimeters of mercury here net hydrostatic pressure is 42 millimeters of mercury here so net ultrafiltration pressure is 10 millimeters of mercury into 12.5 that is equal to 125 ml per minute that is the gm okay so physiology is not as easy as it seems but if you study properly it's easy question if you know the values I have discussed Krishkumar has also shown this so many times. Clinical pathology, very simple question, man. Rubbery lymph node, fever, night sweats, B symptoms are there. So it's mostly looking like binucleated ouli and all those things. So Hodgkin, CD15, CD30. If it is nodular, lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin, CD20, CD45. So it's 15 and 30 here. Okay, simple question. Pathology only, nothing medicine. Now, this is where some people have had a confusion. 10 year old boy with elevated total leukocyte count, hemoglobin of 9, so anyway we are discussing anemia here, with decreased MCV and decreased MCH, okay. So, uh, MCH 20 is definitely on the lower side, less than 28 itself we take it as low, less than 80 we take it as low in MCV, so decreased MCV, decreased MCH, so microcytic hypochromic anemia okay microcytic hypochromic anemia in a microcytic hypochromic anemia okay what are the possibilities iron deficiency anemia thal trait or minor anemia of chronic disease which is more normocytic normochromic much more than microcytic hypochromic this i think i have taught you okay then sideroblastic anemia which is more dimorphic Dimorphic. Okay, so these are the options. Sickle is actually not at all like this, so we are putting out sickle. Three options are there. Thalassemia, they have not mentioned whether it is straight or minor or major, nothing they mentioned. Just saying that it is a thalassemia. Now, what value it has, I have no idea. Iron deficiency anemia, they should mention low ferritin, which is not there in the option, or they should mention low serum iron or increased TIBC nothing like that mentioned okay so i cannot write iron deficiency anemia thalassemia trait intermediate minor nothing mentioned so what will i write i will write anemia of chronic disease because ferritin is 30 to 300 that's normal and ferritin can be normal or increased here and patient is having some inflammation so i think it is anemia of chronic disease it's the only way you can write next one this is a proper tough question this is the first question that i am going to discuss which i feel is tough 
which even for me is a tough question. So, it's tough for everyone, it's a tough question. True about hereditary spherocytes. I have discussed HS in detail. Uh, Ilajan has also discussed HS in detail, but I think even with that, you will not be able to answer this question. Uh, so, let us see. At least 25% cases have a family history of HS. Stuck for you to say, but generally HS is autosomal dominant disease, sometimes autosomal recessive disease, and almost everybody has a positive family history in HS, almost everyone. It is like inherited disease. De novo mutation, 10 to 20% cases can be there. So, quoting the textbook statement, minimum 75 to 80% will have a positive family history. So, at least 25% is wrong. It is at least 75%. Okay. High MCS, this everybody will be knowing. When we discussed HS, the concentration was always on MCHC. You are having spherocytes. And spherocytes are the cells which have high MCHC. You can see the normal MCHC 33.5 to 34.5. Here you are having 35 to 36, which makes them automatically very fragile. MCH, there is no change. MCV, there is no change. It's almost the same. Okay, which means that it should be in MCHC. So, high MCH is for the mnemonic? Wrong. Okay, so that's also wrong. That we know. Gallstones develop by 4 to 5 years of age. So, gallstones can be there in any chronic hemolytic state. And I was also not exactly sure when gallstones exactly develop. This we really don't know. But I knew one thing that we are doing splenectomy in a serious case by 6 years. Okay, most of the cases we plan splenectomy mostly by 6 years. This I know is because gallstones develop later on. So, when gallstones develop later on, I should do splenectomy before gallstones develop. So, gallstones develop by 4 to 5 years of age is wrong because it develops later on. That's why we are doing splenectomy at 6 to prevent that. Splenectomy doesn't protect against developing gallstones. No, splenectomy protects. That's why you are doing splenectomy. It protects against developing gallstones. So, actually all the four statements to me are wrong. Whether the statements are actually this, I am not sure. But whatever four statements I got are wrong. So, you can just see for yourself whether the answer was something else or the options were something else. But the statements that I have told you, this is what I have got. But these are wrong statements. If you are asking, if you are asking me to mark a correct answer in this, at least 25% have a family history. Okay, 25 is less than 75. So, at least 25, but it's at least 75. Okay, all the four are wrong. That's it. Tough question. Okay. Identify. The moment you see this, you know, right? Small blue lymphocytes with these smart cells. CLL and so many other questions were also there which Ilama will discuss which all what me and both Ilama have discussed. Eosinophilia basophilia means myeloproliferation, myeloproliferation means CML. What did I tell you? RBC is part of myeloid lineage, platelet is part of myeloid lineage, neutrophil is part of myeloid lineage, eosinophil, basophil are all part of myeloid lineage. Right? When they are all part of myeloid lineage, what happens? You have neutrophilia, you have eosinophilia, you have basophilia, RBC increase, platelet increase, that is called a myeloproliferative disease. And in a myeloproliferative disease, we have PCRV, we have PMF, we have ET and a kingmaker, CM. This is not everybody would have answered. 35 year old woman with fatigue, hemoglobin 5, okay, anemia, okay, ferritin 10. What did I tell you? In an anemia question, when it is a uh, hyperproliferative anemia, they have not mentioned that, but MCV 24, once again microcytosis. So, microcytic anemia, again IDA, thaltrate, anemia of chronic disease and sideroblastic anemia. The moment you get what, image is showing microcytic hypochromic, whatever. If you are having low ferritin, there is only one answer. Ferritin high, so many things can happen. Ferritin low, less than 30 means there is deficiency of iron stores. Iron stores means only iron deficiency anemia, nothing else. Okay, simple question again, based on the same concept. Hemochromatosis to assess iron overload, what do you do? Hemochromatosis to assess iron overload, you need serum ferritin plus transferrin saturation. This we discussed under hemochromatosis and again discussed in pathology also. In the question, this combination option was not there, only ferritin was there, so ferritin is the correct answer. And I have told you that in detail. Hemoglobin 5, absolute reticount 9, calculate corrected reticount. I think everybody better understand this. The beginning of hematology video is itself. To calculate RP, T production index, which is your corrected reticulocyte count divided by 2. Okay. So, what is your corrected reticount? Absolute reticount into hemoglobin of the patient divided by decide hemoglobin, which we keep as 15 in males. So, here absolute is 9 into 5 by 15, 9 by 3, 3. And RPA will be 1.5. RPA less than 2, hyperproliferative. When in hyperproliferative, what to do? Hyperproliferative, what to do? All this we have mentioned. If you want me to, I am asking you. To watch one video of mine, 
where I believe that you will start um, having that kind of a feeling for the subject. I think it's gametology. Gametology is done with a lot of feel. I mean, that feel is coming from within itself, which I'm not doing anything specifically for, but that feel is always there. Nephrology is a science that I've studied. Cardiology is a science I like so much. Respiratory is a science that I, I believe is got to be understood in a particular way. That is there, but uh, chemistry we've done with a lot of fields, so I think I want you. All those many other things are overlap with the lamb. If you watch pathology, you need not watch, that's okay. But if you watch with that interest, definitely it will augur well. So, these many questions and many, many more are there, which are basically equal to basics. So, that's the importance of knowing basics. Fine. So, from there, we come to the core clinical part, okay? The core clinical questions, which I'm supposed to discuss. Ideally, I could have started from here, but I just wanted you to know the importance of medicine with respect to basics and the importance of basics with respect to medicine and how much they are interlinked. We go to the first clinical question. This clinical question is actually very easy. What it is the first thing I told you when you discuss management of ARDs. Whenever there is ARDs, call the anesthetist because ventilator settings are complex. You can't do it by yourself. So, please call the anesthetist. And as far as the anesthetist is concerned, he has two very, very important things to keep in mind. One is called volume trauma and second is called barotrauma. Okay. So, volume trauma, barotrauma. First thing is that his tidal volume has to be on the lower side, less than 6 ml per kg. Why? Because higher tidal volume has led to barotrauma that is actually led on to pneumothorax. So, we have always kept it as low tidal volume. Along with low tidal volume, your plateau pressure has to be less than 30. And to prevent expiratory collapse of the alveoli, you have to be always keeping, to prevent what is called as volume trauma, PEEP has to be always above 5 centimeters of water. So, these are the three main things. PEEP above 5, low tidal volume and plateau pressure less than 30. This is what is actually given benefit and here you can see increased PEEP is the answer. This is to show you that so many things have been tried in ventilation, ventilation as far as strategy in ARDs is concerned. But see, the level of recommendation is very weak, very, very, very weak. Only two things to me have very strong recommendation. The two things which have strong recommendation are very low tidal volume. Okay. And this was when I was doing EBBs, we were taught low tidal volume with high frequency ventilation. But see, high frequency ventilation has only a level D recommendation now. So it is low tidal volume. Second is to keep a very high peep or keep the lungs open. Recruitment maneuvers are generally not required, which is high peep. So please study low tidal volume, high peep, and low plateau pressure low plateau pressure that's it rest have variable recommendation even people have trying prone ventilation again all this is like question mark question mark so high peep and low tidal volume body trauma barotrauma that's it and this we've discussed very clearly in the videos also so this is i think not that easy but if you know this it's okay even the criteria this is the berlin definition even there you can see Assessed on at least 5 cm of PEEP. That means, as I have told you, the criteria. Criteria to be satisfied itself, PEEP should be there. If you know that, you will very easily answer. Young patient comes to the clinic with erythematous lesions over the exposed areas of the skin, like this, okay. Uh, arms, chest, etc. Complaints of arthralgia and breathlessness. Which among the following antibodies will be useful in diagnosing this condition? Very, very tricky question, okay. Because male, female not mentioned. Erythematous lesions which are looking like photosensitive lesions. So, probably they want photosensitive lesion with arthralgia. So, that is SLE. SLE patient having breathlessness is not very common because SLE patient generally doesn't have ILD. Okay. So, when they have breathlessness, it is hard to figure it out because lung wise you can have pleuritis with effusion. So, maybe that breathlessness, okay, fine. I agree with that. So, if it is SLE, what will be useful in diagnosing this condition? What will be useful in diagnosing this condition? So, because it is SLE syndromere, I am striking off because it is seen in limited sclerodrama. Antihistone is drug induced SLE. So, drug induced, there is no drug here. So, I am striking it off. So, these two things are not there. Now, this question, which many people had a confusion should I write ANA? Should I write anti DSDNA? So, should I write ANA? Should I write anti DSDNA? This is tough to say. Now, diagnosing this condition means SLE. SLE diagnostic criteria is SLE international clinical classification criteria. In that you can see ANA, in that you can see anti DSDNA also. So both are useful in diagnosis. But ANA is your window towards this world of CTD. So obviously you have to do this first. If ANA is positive, then you will do anti DSDNA. 
you'll do anti -tease staining without doing any generally we don't do anti -tease staining but you can without doing do, doing ANA you can do anti -tease staining and if that is positive that is strongly suggestive strongly suggestive because it is very very specific so depending on the wordings of the question you have to answer if these are the exact wordings which among the following antibodies will be useful in diagnosing this condition ANA will not help you to diagnose this condition it will just open up this world of CTD anti -DS stain if you do outside by immunoblot or if you do anti -DS stain by ELISA and if that comes as positive that is also not like 100% but it's very specific for SLE so you can think more probably in terms of SLE so that way when you think this is the answer okay but I don't know whether these are the exact wordings if these are the exact wordings then because ANA doesn't help you to diagnose SLE it helps you to say that it is a CTD it doesn't help you to tell you that it's an SLE diagnosing this condition probably you may have to say DST okay that's it fine I hope you understood then they asked about this that is in the afternoon session gotten papule salt and pepper and this photosensitive rash and here this slightly confusing question where many people wrote ANA if you read too much into the question you may get confused absence of loud S1 in MS would indicate all except very very simple question I don't know why some people were having a confusion with this let us go to the sound called S1 where is S1 heard or where are we now we have three phases in systole we have five phases in diastole correct systole three phases are isovolumetric contraction rapid ejection reduced ejection correct five phases in diastole a proto diastole isovolumetric relaxation rapid filling reduced filling and atrial systole so let us start off our discussion as we have done in the videos at this point that is begin before atrial systole so here the av valves are open okay that means your atrioventricular valves are open semilunar valves are closed and blood is filling into the ventricle from the atria filling 70 percent of the filling has occurred 70 percent filling has occurred for remaining 30 percent of the filling to occur atrium has to contract so remaining 30 percent of the filling is to occur atrium has to contract atrium is contracted now the lv pressure will start to go above the la pressure so at this point the av valves close av valves close correct this point when the av valves close you get s1 okay you get s1 that's just before ivc i told you there is valve coaptation it is not closing valve coaptation annulus will contract valve closes 12 standard 11 understanding pg level understanding is annulus will contract the valve will coapt together you can see what is coaptation in detail there is a zone of coaptation being formed and you have tensing of the leaflet after coaptation so tensing of the leaflet after coaptation this tensing of the leaflet after coaptation leads on to s1 okay factors affecting the intensity of s1 s1 is a high pitch sound what are the factors affecting the intensity of s1 the factors affecting the intensity of s1 are number one zone of coaptation how well is the zone of coaptation formed position of the leaflet at the end of diastole okay position of leaflet at end of diastole that is number two number three is premature versus late closure premature versus late closure okay number four the rate of rise of pressure in isovolumetric contraction or dp by dt of ivc okay dp by dt of ivc rate of rise of pressure in isovolumetric contraction so that's it number five so premature versus late closure and of course heart rate these are the five things which i have told you when zone of coaptation is not formed properly why is zone of coaptation not formed properly because the valve leaflets are now in a regurgitating setup or the leaflet disease is there that is mitral regurgitation because of its zone of coaptation is not formed we have mr and mr is always characterized by soft s1 not based on severity it is always soft s1 position of the leaflets at the end of diastole normally leaflets at the end of diastole will be in a semi-closed position floating okay so they will come in close like this so will it produce any sound no sound if there is no filling no filling proper then the leaflets will be like this right down at the bottom okay so when they have to close what should they do they must come and close like this okay which means they will actually come from a very far off distance right from the bottom and close like this so when is that there is no filling there's a block between the la and the lv and that is ms so position of the leaflets at the end of diastole wide apart in ms and that is why it is loudest one 
So the first reason for loudest one in MS is that the leaflets are actually speaking wide apart. They are down at the bottom. So they have to come in close from a distance. Premature versus late closure. Premature closure always leads to softest one as in AR. Late closure in MS is loudest one. What is the meaning of that? In AR, the LV pressures are already above the LA pressures because the LV is dilated, eccentric hypertrophy, it's taking all the blood. So, we will close early, close very early. MS, the LA is having a higher pressure because of the stenosis. So, the LV pressure has to increase, increase, increase above the LA pressure. So, will it take more time or less time? More time. So, the valve will close from more distance, it will take more time. So, MS will have loudest one and AR will have softest one. Correct. DP by DT of isovolumetric contraction. The isovolumetric contraction in MR is very poor because half the blood is going into the iota, half the blood is going back into the LA. So, DP by DT of IVC very poor in MR. So, MR will have softest one. Correct. What happens with respect to heart rate? Heart rate means you take a bradycardia. Bradycardia means longer diastole. Longer diastole means more filling. More filling means leaflets are at the top leaflets are floating so leaflets are floating leaflets are at the top and they are not widely separated they are floating at the top and what position they are having semi closed position so when they are closing from a semi closed position you get a soft s1 tachycardia means less filling they are down at the bottom wide apart so they will actually come in close to the distance so this will actually lead on to loud s1 so brady soft s1 tachish is equal to loud s1 all these points are clear now you tell me what happens with respect to AS, AR, MS, MR and S1. AS nothing, AS and S1 have nothing to do with each other. Only thing iotic ejection click may be confused with S1, that's all. AR is equal to premature closure. So, whenever you are having premature closure, soft S1. MR again you are having loss of DP by DT, you are having loss of cohabitation zone. Because of loss of DP by DT, loss of cohabitation zone, again soft S1. So, AR and MR softest one. Correct. Now, we come to MS. MS, independent of whether it is mild, moderate or severe MS, we always have loudest one. Correct. We have loudest one. And when is that you do not have loudest one in MS? When we have the calcific immobile leaflets. Okay. Calcific immobile leaflets or something else predominating, you cannot get loudest one. This much is the theory. Everybody knows the theory. Let us go back to the question. Absence of loudest one in MS would indicate all the following except. When you are having a hard block, you are having brady. Brady is equal to soft S1. So, that is correct. Okay. Calcific valve, always soft S1. Aortic regurgitation, premature closure, soft S1. So, absence of loud S1 would be explained by all this. But mild moderate severity in MS has got nothing to do with loud S1. So, mild MS, you can get loud S1. Severity in MS is equal to duration of the murmur. Okay. And S2 OS gap. S2 OS gap short, you will have more severe. Duration murmur more, you will have more severe. These are the points, not loudest one. Tough question, but if you watch the video properly, you will be able to answer 100%. Okay. Next question. Increased anion gap is seen in metabolic acidosis. Just keep in mind that causes for metabolic acidosis are K is ketoacidosis. Okay. Ketoacidosis can be equal to diabetic ketoacidosis, alcoholic ketoacidosis, Starvation ketoacidosis. U is uremia, CKD. S is salicylate. M is methanol. A stands for ethylene glycol. Okay. So don't think it is like alcohol means you must be knowing ethylene glycol specifically. And L stands for lactic acidosis. This is increased anion gap. Okay. This is what we call high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Normal anion gap metabolic acidosis is equal to RTA or GA loss of bicarb. Okay, where positive urine anion gap is equal to RTA. Positive urine anion gap is equal to RTA. Okay, and here methanol, ethylene glycol, we can get high osmolal gap. High osmolal gap. All this we have seen. Okay, so increased anion gap is seen in metabolic acidosis. And 8 to 12 is the normal anion gap. Okay, but always remember anion gap is equal to sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. That is there. But always correct for albumin. Always correct for albumin. Never forget that. So, you have to calculate the corrected anion gap. Which is anion gap plus 2.5 into 
4.5 minus serum albumin. Okay, 2.5 into 4.5 minus serum albumin. Fine, yes. Elderly female with a history of CBR vomiting was treated aggressively for dehydration. She became mute, quadriparatic and rigid. Nothing more you need to know, right? What is that I have told you? Whenever you correct for hyponatremia, there is always a problem. What is that? See, this is the cell. This is the blood. Hmm? You are having hyponat. You are having hyponat. Fine. When you are having hyponat, water is moving from the blood to the cell. This is the problem. And the cell is swelling. Cell swelling. So, edema of the cell, which is in the brain, that is cerebral edema. And that is the problem. Cerebral edema is keeping on increasing. If you don't know the kinetics of this disease, when you see the patient, you may, un I mean, unfortunately, because you don't know, you may be giving NS, which is a hypertonic fluid. Hypertonic fluid. So, when you are giving a hypertonic fluid, again, more water will move from the blood to the cell. And that can lead on to increasing cerebral edema. Correct? And the patient can die. So, that is why you should be very, very careful. When you correct, if you overcorrect, then there can be something called central pontine myelinolysis, which is not confined to the pons. It's better called as osmotic demyelination syndrome, which I told you can present from a pseudobulbar palsy kind of a presentation to completely quadriparatic presentation, quadriparatic mute presentation. Okay. And the first signs to look out for are rigidity. This we've discussed in detail. So, this is a case of rapid sodium correction leading on to ODS or central pontine myelinosis, now called osmotic demyelination syndrome. We've discussed this in detail, how to correct sodium, everything we've seen. I'm not going to that again. See, from that simple ADH thing, how many questions come? Heart disease as breathlessness is something which all of you should be knowing from your ward thing. Class 3 is market limitation, class 2 is slight limitation. So, how do you differentiate between this? Less than ordinary activity or ordinary activity? Less than ordinary activity produces palpitation or dyspnea and that is class 3. And when we say class 3, we say patient having difficulty or breathing difficulty while brushing teeth, going to the bathroom, putting dress. These are the three classical descriptions because of which it is NYHA3. Okay, some people ask me NYHA2 is not there in the option. Can it be NYHA2? It can be because see, what do you mean by NYHA2? Slight limitation. So, ordinary physical activities, it's difficult to differentiate. So, please keep in mind that brushing teeth, putting dress, going to bathroom is class 3. Okay. Patient having perioral numbness, okay, perioral numbness, tingling and tetany, what are the cause of hypocalcemia? Except, what are the cause of hypercalcemia except was the afternoon crusting. This I think all of you know, right? Hypocalcemia causes can be related to PTH absence, which is true hypopara. And true hypopara is an option here, correct? Then it can be related to PTH excess, which is pseudo hypopara and secondary hyperpara. And secondary hyperpara is what we see in CKD. So CKD is there, correct? Then it can be due to redistribution. Redistribution leading on to hypocal because of tumor lysis as well as rhabdo where phosphorus is released combining with calcium. Catecholamines causing redistribution of calcium from the blood back into the cell that is seen in acute pancreatitis. Okay, even in sepsis. Correct, all this we have seen. So, pancreatitis is there, CKD is there, hyperpara, vitamin D toxicity, vitamin D is always excess calcium. So, it's simple answer. And the answer to this question is vitamin D toxicity. That is hyperpara, hypopara causes. Signs of heart failure. Okay, Where do you, what are the signs? Orthopnea is a sign of left heart failure. What have I told you? Signs of heart failure are due to decreased cardiac output, forward, increased LAP, correct, that is backward, increased RAP, that is seen in right heart failure and we differentiated that. And LV EDP equal to LAP equal to pulmonary capillary venous pressure. And whenever you have increase in LV EDP, that is equal to dyspnea, correct. So, Disney after 2 hours of bed rest, shortness of breath after 2 to 3 hours of sleep is all like PND. PND is like half filled bottle, 3 fourth filled bottle, orthopnea is fully filled bottle, left heart failure. Right upper quadrant pain, that is capitomegaly, part of right heart failure. So, BCD are actually speaking correct. A is non pulsatile rise in JVP that we have mentioned very clearly. CT and SVC obstruction are the only two conditions cardiac tamponade and SVC obstruction. 
and in cardiac time very high intrapericardial pressure so normal pulse attire pulse mean your waves may not be that visible these are the two causes for non pulse attire everywhere else it is pulse attire so i can't take non pulse attire so i have to take bcd fortunately abcd was not there in the option if abcd was there it means slightly confusing but always remember if said non pulse attire rise in jvp svc obstruction cardiac amenite and signs of heart failure please go back and watch the module in detail it is one of those modules which i want everybody to watch because it is a very common thing symptoms due to decrease cardiac output symptoms due to increased lap symptoms due to increased rap correct yeah and we have what is called hf ref hf pef hf mef less than 40% more than 50% preserved ejection fraction mid range ejection fraction is 40 to 50% that's it female patient clinically diagnosed to have hypothyroid okay simple question you can see i have done a box and mentioned everything first thing i told you this total free t3 t4 thing no don't have to look at it at all only free t3 free t4 when free t3 free t4 is low and tsh is high it is definitely equal to hypothyroidism and mixed rheuma coma there is another question okay mixed rheuma coma question which uh, a hypothyroid patient coming to you with crisis with hypotension shock and hypothermia all these things that is mixed rheuma coma question iodides before surgery will be of use by reducing your thyroid hormone levels by bull check of it so use of iodide was also another straightforward question so three questions came on thyroid iodide use was very simple question preoperatively given mixed rheuma coma was very simple and very straightforward with hypothermia with hypo hypoglycemia hypotension and the patient in shock with all these low voltage complexes and scenarios i have discussed and this is the whole thing and what have i told you when tsh is high in medicine it means that either tsh is high because of hypothyroidism tsh is high because of thyroid hormone resistance okay and tsh is high because of a tsh secreting adenoma only this way tsh can be high okay this we've discussed in great detail fine yeah now following clinical examination was performed they were actually looking for the ankle jerk here ankle jerk is obviously exaggerated umn i'm not going to go into more depths in that you know it is umn fine and babinski was also asked fine so evening session there was another question on babinski sign so morning session they asked angle jerk evening session they asked babinski sign i don't know whether the same photograph was given please go back and learn how to do it properly which you would have done for me what okay now road traffic accident if i get a question on rt it comes as renal tubular acidosis so road traffic accident here incomplete lesion and you are having the central part of the cord involved this is something which we have mentioned so many times you know when you are having a cut through the cord at the level we have lmn below you have umn bowel and bladder involved and central part of the cord means what do you see the fibers which are crossing that is your spinothalamic is getting involved that is called dissociative sensory loss but posterior column is not involved so at the level you are having lmn below the level you are having umn so i think i have actually made this very clear in that syringomyelia discussion you can actually go and see the syringomyelia discussion this is a spinal cord okay you are having like this central part central cavity for example there is an injury or an expansion so it is expanding 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 like this it will go and hit on the anterior console go and hit on the anterior console so at the level you are having lmn complete loss of inhibition so below umn okay bowel bladder are in the center so bowel and bladder involved okay then posterior column is not crossing so it is paired where spinothalamic tract is crossing so spinothalamic tract pain and temperature involved correct and your corticospinal tract is cervical thoracic lumbar sacral medial to lateral so sacral is mostly spared it's called sacral sparing so lmn lesion of the upper limb and trunk and umn lesion of the lower limb more correct umn lesion of the upper limb and lmn of the lower limb not possible bowel and bladder involvement possible posterior tract involvement not possible so the answer is actually speaking a and c yes a and c fine simple question it is 50 year old male patient with a left sided hemiparesis damaged which part of the internal capsule is like your bread and butter for finding the mbps it is through the anterior two third of the posterior limb of the internal capsule that goes traveling cortical spinal tract so we have a pure motor hemiparesis you will always think about the posterior limb of the internal capsule although basal pons can be involved this is the best answer ataxic hemiparesis is when you think of more of basal pons think of posterior limb but also think more of basal pons 
and disarthre with clumsy hand. Disarthre with clumsy hand, we think more of genu. So disarthre with clumsy hand, we think of genu, comes under lacuna stroke. Ataxic hemiparesis again coming under lacuna, we think of BC points. And pure motor, we think of posterior limb. So when you think of this, the answer is always posterior limb. No explanation, nothing is expected to know. Okay, even if you are not doing any coaching, expected to know. HIV patient with a CD4 count of 200, cough, fever, dyspnea, everybody knows you are looking for PCP. And PCP is got hilar opacities which may be missed on an X-ray. How do you treat PCP? I have told you the exact guideline. It is cotrimoxazole, that is the preferred drug in PCP. Okay, for how many days? 21 days. What is the dose of trimethoprim? Roughly 20 mg per kg per day. What is the dose of sulfamethoxazole? Roughly 80 mg per kg per day. Okay, 1 is to 4. What are the alternatives? Clinda plus primaquin is one alternative. Atavacon is another alternative. Trimethoprim plus dapsone is another alternative. Pendamin is another alternative. If you don't know, it's okay. But very, very important, steroids for moderate to severe disease. Because it's like a kind of a cytokine storm. So steroids, very, very important. How to give and how to taper and all, you need not know. But steroids are very much part of it. When do you give steroids? If you exactly ask me, PAO2 is going down and alpha gradient is increasing. But that you don't know. That you need not know. Moderate to severe disease, you give steroids. So, it is basically cotrimoxazole plus steroid. Okay. But please try to keep in mind that we give cotrimoxazole for how many days? We give cotrimoxazole for 21 days. And how much of trimethoprim is there? Roughly 20 mg per kg per day. So, when you are taking in a 50 kg person, it comes to roughly 1000 mg per day. Correct. And how much of sulfamethoxazole are you giving? You are giving 100 mg or 80 mg per kg per day which comes to 4000 milligram. Okay, that's it. Simple question. Hemophilia, what is there? X-linked disease, male factor 8. Mucosal bleeding is a platelet type bleeding. Here you are having joint bleeding or hemarthrosis or you are having something like a muscle bleeding or big ecchymotic patch. Differences between platelet bleeding and your uh, clotting factor bleed. Detail we have discussed. Okay, so 1, 2, 3. And remember, 8 deficiency is called hemophilia A. 9 deficiency is called hemophilia B, 11 deficiency is called hemophilia C and 5 deficiency is called parahemophilia. Okay, 11 is C, A, B. These are X-linked recessive conditions. These are autosomal recessive conditions. Too simple, I guess, right? Yeah. Now we go to more questions on the second session. Okay, these are mostly the questions asked in first session, but I have discussed a lot about the second session also in this because questions were same. They didn't want any kind of a partiality. So probably they put the same question, just changed it one person. That's all. Nothing much to discuss here. 11 year old boy, tremor is there. Sister is having disease. Hepatomegaly is seen. Jaundice is also there. Yeah. Maximum jaundice, where do you get hepatomegaly in a child? You have to think of liver enzymes elevated in a child. You have to think of cirrhosis. You have to think of acute. You have to think of everywhere. Diagnosis, Wilson. Okay. I'm not discussing in detail. You've done big, big modules on Wilson. ECG is there. Narrow QRS tachycardia with a irregular RR. RR and a fibrillatory waves in the background. Okay. No definite P waves. So, it's easily AFib. AFib in detail. Revision video, original video. Done in detail. Uh, when to go for rhythm control as far as possible, try to go for rhythm control. Drugs like gibutilide, vernacolant and amidron, rate controlling drugs like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. But nowhere did we mention adenosine. Adenosine is nowhere part of the treatment of AFib. And in case you are having a WPW with AFib, if you give adenosine and then you block the normal pathway, patient will die because all the inverts will go to the ventricle, BTP fib. So that is there. But more than that, adenosine has no value in AFib. In none of the studies that it has. This is something which we have discussed so many times. You know? So, PQRST, PQRST, then we have a PQRST, then we are having a P wave. So, after the P wave is when you are missing. So, it is not a sinonodal block. VT is out. First degree heart block will have every P wave followed by QRS. So, here one P wave is not followed by QRS. Third degree heart block will have AV dissociation. PP interval will be one, RR interval will be another, PR there will be no kind of a correlation. So, simple second degree. What is the difference between Mobitz type 1, Mobitz type 2, advanced second degree? Please go and see module bradyarrhythmia. Progressive, progressive prolongation of PR interval, then dip, dipping a beat, missing a beat is actually called as Mobitz type 1. Mobitz type 2 and advanced second degree, please go and watch. We have done a small module on bradyarrhythmia, it is more than enough for the exam. But neat again, they do not ask me in ECG, so it is only INI pass. Every time they ask a question on table, no, on hepatitis B, I told you it's a core area, acute or chronic or whatever it is. Now this question they have changed a little bit. So they are trying to ask you about co-infection versus super-infection. 
co-infection versus super-infection. And this we have done in detail. Let us see what is co-infection, what is super-infection. Co-infection we will see first. A person with acute hepatitis B getting acute hepatitis D and the risk of going to chronicity is almost not there. This acute hepatitis B plus acute hepatitis D is called co-infection, which means anti-HBC IgM will be positive, HBC AG will be positive and anti-HDV IgM will be positive. This is called co-infection and this for chronicity is less. So, if you see the graph, you can see anti-HDV IgM, you can see HDV RNA is there, HBC AG will be there and anti-HBC IgM is not shown, anti-HBC IgM will also be there. Everything will go away at the end patient will have only anti-HBS persisting, nothing else. Okay, that is co-infection. So, what are they asked here? Which of the following is most useful in diagnosing HDV co-infection above super-infection? Okay, above super-infection. So, you know what is co-infection. Now, let us see what is the meaning of super-infection. Super-infection means that you are already chronic hepatitis B. You are already chronic hepatitis B. That means you are HBCG now positive and the HBC IgG positive. And the HBC IgG positive. Correct. On top of this, you are contracting what? You are contacting H H H hepatitis D virus. So, you become anti-HDV IgM positive. Correct. But it goes to chronicity. So, it just like that becomes anti-HDV IgG positive. So, from anti-HDV IgM, you will become anti-HDV IgG. And that is what it is mean by going to chronicity. So, see this. Your anti-HDV IgM comes down. But total anti-HDV increases. That means, this is anti-HDV IgG. And HDV RNA persists, so persistent HDV infection. HBCG is persisting, which means it is chronic hepatitis B infection. And anti HBC IgG is not shown, and the HBC IgG is also there. Correct. So now let us go back to the question. So in a co infection, what is there? Anti HBC IgM, anti HDV IgM, HBS AG. Correct. Super infection, what is there? Anti HBC IgG, anti HDV IgM, which will soon become IgG, depends on when you are seeing, and HBCG, and anti and HBCG. Yeah, this is it. Now, which of the following which diagnose, will help to diagnose co infection above super infection? Absence of anti HBC IgG, absence of anti HBC IgG would actually tell you that it is a co-infection, correct. Absence of anti-HBC IgG, does it tell you that it is a co-infection? Because if anti-HBC IgG is not there, then you can say that it is not a super-infection. Because if it is a super-infection, anti-HBC IgG will be 100% present. When anti-HBC IgG is not there, then you probably say that it is not super-infection. You cannot say it is co-infection. You can say it is not super-infection, that is all. Okay. High HDV viral load, HB viral load. Viral load has got nothing to do. Viral load can be high or low. So, you cannot take it that way. Generally, in super infection, HDV viral load will be higher. But that you cannot see. Presence of a IgM and the HDV antibody. And the HDV IG antibody IgM is seen in co-infection. It can be seen in super infection also. So, again, cannot differentiate. So, absence of anti-HBC IgG antibody means that it is not a super infection. Okay, because if it is super infection, you will see anti HBC IgG. When you are not seeing anti HBC IgG, it is not super infection. So, it is probably co infection. That way only you can take it. This we have discussed in detail at the end of hepatitis B. Correct? So, once again, do not have a doubt. Person with acute hepatitis B plus acute hepatitis D not going to chronicity is called co infection. So, anti HBC IgM, anti HDV IgM is that is what that is what you need to know. Super infection is a person having underlying chronic hepatitis B. So, anti HBC IgG. On top of that, you are having acute hepatitis D which will go into chronicity, which means anti HDV IgM going to anti HDV IgG. Tough question. Relatively tough question. Testing your concept more than anything else. Violent flinging movements you have seen in the watch so many times, you know, hemibalismus, subthalamic nucleus. Cardiac nucleus is chorea, hemibalismus, subthalamic nucleus. Krishnamar has taught you, I have taught you so many times. Benedict syndrome and Northern Agal and so many things. Perioral tingling numbness, second repeat, repeat question, vitamin D toxicity. So, we have seen this. Thrombolysis can be considered in all the following except. What have I taught you? Somebody who comes within four and a half hours, who is having no bleed on the CT, somebody is having a BP which is controlled even with drugs, okay. Even with drugs, the BP is less than 185, 110, 
okay who is more than 18 years old who has no major bleeding history and whose MRI or CT is showing a density which is less than one third if it is more than one third with cerebral edema, we don't do so all these patients we take for thrombolysis so BP more than 180 110 we don't consider MRI density is less than one third of the area we consider ischemic age stroke we consider onset of symptoms less than four and a half hours we consider so this is the answer and exactly what Harrison that's they've just taken it from there and I have taught you everything about stroke management okay such so a basic question all the things you don't have to sit and study just basic idea we need to have what we do with respect to the patient if a patient comes to you what will you do when a patient comes to me clinically I'll make a diagnosis of stroke not sure just like this if I'm having a doubt, I go for diffusion imaging because diffusion imaging will tell me whether there is a stroke or not. Okay, then perfusion imaging will tell me about penumbra. Plain CT will actually tell me about bleed or not. Okay, less than 4.5 hours the patient has come to me. Patient is more than 18 years old. BP has been controlled to less than 185, 110 and MRI is showing involvement less than one third of the area. Okay, and the patient has no major bleeding. Then, if it is a first order vessel involved on MR angio, then we go for accessible vessel. We actually go for thrombectomy with the help of the interventional neurologist. If it's a second order vessel which can't access, we go for lysis. With what? Alteplis. Okay, enough and more discussions have been done on this. Elderly male brought by his son, not using left arm. Many times I have told you this. We have the right brain, left brain. Right parietal lobe left parietal lobe right parietal lobe actually controls your right extrapersonal space and left extrapersonal space okay left parietal lobe controls your right extrapersonal space right extrapersonal space okay so if you have a lesion of the left parietal lobe nothing will happen because right will control both if you have a lesion of the right parietal lobe then left is there so right side is saved but your left extrapersonal space is gone so you'll neglect everything on the left hand side. This is called left side hemispatial neglect or anosognosia, extreme forms. That's why the answer is right parietal. Right. Correct? And that is why it is a non-dominant thing. So what are the examples for non-dominant? Constructional apraxia, dressing apraxia, visuospatial disorientation, and hemispatial neglect. Visuospatial disorientation means you don't know what is the bedroom, bathroom, etc. Construction apraxia means you cannot construct anything. Dressing apraxia means you don't know which is your shirt pant. You will put shirt down, pant up, etc. So, construction apraxia, dressing apraxia, which is special disorientation, hemispatial neglect. Hemispatial neglect is completely neglecting the left side. You will not eat from the left side of the plate. You will not shave left side. You will go and hit on the left side every time like that. Simple question. Pediatric patient with B leukemia, poor prognostic factors. Two to nine year old girl with L1 form, L1 we don't use now, is the person who has a good prognosis. Less than 1, more than 10 years is bad. Male is considered to be slightly inferior prognosis. Okay, L2, L3 in olden times bad. But nowadays this is not what we are looking for. We say high counts, definitely bad. Adult, definitely bad. 922, 411, 119. Okay, 922, 411, 119, very bad. 1221 we see in children, so that is good. Hyperdiploidy is good. Okay. Hypodiploidy, bad. T cell, bad. CNS involvement, testis involvement, bad. Okay. But the response to first cycle is the most important thing. In children, respond to steroids. Seventh day, if the smear shows no blast, that is good. But otherwise, very bad. And high count ALL, very bad. So hyperdiploidy is good. Less than one year, bad. 922, bad. 411 bad. So, hyperdiploidy good. I have done an extensive discussion on this. Even that much detailing and all is not required. Study the basic points is enough. AML, ALN and all, we have gone for extensive discussion so that you get so much confidence. Sitting in the exam hall, I have said this 10,000 times. My seniors have told me we can only answer questions which are one step below what we have studied. One step above, anyway, we can't answer. But to answer questions at the same level which we have studied is mostly not possible sitting in the exam hall because of the stress. So, to study one step above is imperative to gain that confidence. Competence are meant to be. So now I will not discuss, okay? We have had so many, many, many discussions. So we have this PHEO and we have this medullary carcinoma thyroid plus these M's, okay? And these M's are what is Marfanoid habitus. We have this megacolon. We have this 
medulated corneal nerve fibers okay all this you've seen so here the answer is medullary carcinoma thyroid okay so going to another question which is uh, more radio and medicine i think everybody would have seen this in the ward also examination finding the infrascapular region for a lower lobe pneumonia so lower lobe pneumonia what will you see um, inspection wise little movement will be less palpation wise that will be confirmed vocal parameters will be slightly on the higher side dull note and percussion which is not stony dull but woody dull and then of course you will get decreased air entry with your classical bronchial breath sounds egophony whispering pectoral okay and all those things so hypersense never it's dullness strider and all no coarse crackles and all no coarse crackles generally you get it in bronchic cases it's not in pneumonia dull note and percussion correct okay simple question just to check out one once in a while whether i've gone to the hospital horner's loss of pain temperature uh, loss of pain and temperature in the face and contralateral body loss of sweating all the symptoms now this is basically to test out whether you have understood what is medial medullary syndrome and what is lateral medullary syndrome simple to understand is medial medullary syndrome where you are having the medial part getting involved sipsilateral element 12th nerve palsy that is the only thing that you see on the same side and on the opposite side you are having contralateral involvement of your corticospinal tract because corticospinal tract will cross from the pyramid so it will come here and then cross like this so it will be opposite side getting involved and you have the posterior column also getting involved on the opposite side why is posterior column getting involved on the opposite side posterior column is actually coming like this and then crossing like this so this is drawn upside down okay in harrison so comes like this and then goes up like this so if it's getting involved here it is opposite side posterior column so opposite side posterior column opposite side corticospinal tract same side element 12th nerve palsy so here obviously pain and temperature nothing is getting involved so posterior column that is getting involved so medial medulla has nothing to do what about lateral medullary syndrome lateral medullary syndrome we've discussed so many times so 1 2 3 4 not involved in lateral medullary syndrome 5 7 8 9 10 11 12 spino cerebellar spino thalamic this is the involvement five is your <coughs> spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve seven is your nucleus tractus solitaris eight is your vestibulo cerebellar fibers nine ten is your nucleus ambiguus and along with that eleven also thirteen is your horner syndrome then you have spino cerebellar fibers and then you have opposite side contralateral spino thalamic tract so that's it if you know that way everything is very clear so spinothalamic tract means opposite side pain and temperature loss spino cerebellar tract means ataxia horner's means you have ptosis meiosis in ophthalmos and you are having spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve means pain and numbness over the ipsilateral half of face nucleus tractus solitaris means you will be having taste loss vestibulo cerebellar means ataxia tinnitus vertigo nucleus ambiguus means dysphagia dysarthria hoarseness simple this i have told so many times so now you are having involvement of the lateral medulla including nucleus ambiguus spinothalamic tract simple question so lateral medulla is also correct b and d just checking out that's what i told in the brain stem that module is very vital please study that as many times as you want loss of pain and temperature but intact touch this is called dissociative sensory loss central canal expansion syringoma idea don't even have to read the question okay this is again see uh, just abg reading when you see 7.5 7.25 okay and then you are asking compensated means what compensation means you should bring it down to near normal no so 7.36 37 like that so this is i won't even read 7.4 is metabolic alkalosis that's correct so co3 is 34 can be metabolic alkalosis should have respiratory acidosis as the compensation so respiratory acidosis as the compensation respiratory acidosis is there so okay this may be right fine but let me see so 34 is the bicarb so bicarb is normal 24 so delta bicarb is 10 compensation is 0.6 or 0.7 so 7 should be the increase that's right so this is metabolic alkalosis with respiratory compensation so correct 7.23 acidosis pco2 increase respiratory acidosis bicarb increase metabolic acidosis so it's not uncompensated metabolic acidosis alone it is metabolic acidosis with respiratory acidosis you can call this as wrong because uncompensated metabolic acidosis is also correct way of putting it but the problem is that this is a much better answer you can't say just uncompensated metabolic acidosis it is metabolic acidosis with respiratory acidosis 
okay or even you can say uncommon sense it's okay to an extent these two options are both correct but i think this is a better answer because it's like respiratory alkalosis is there sorry metabolic alkalosis is there respiratory acidosis is there and ph has come back to normal so it looks okay this would be better called as metabolic plus respiratory acidosis okay inside that which is predominant means 56 minus 40 by 40 24 minus 16 by 24 okay that is a change this is a change in what your pco2 this is a change in your bicarb so what is the change in pco2 56 minus 40 by 40 or it is 16 by 40 that is 40 percent okay whereas here 8 by 24 which is only 30 percent so which is the more predominant disease here respiratory so uncompensated metabolic acidosis alone you cannot say it is respiratory and metabolic acidosis so which who is predominant respiratory so because of which although these two options are actually speaking correct better answer is this one this is the better answer okay last one is a better answer this is actually speaking a b c d so d is the better answer okay please don't have a confusion when you say ph is equal to 7.23 you will straight away write acidosis when bicarb is equal to 16 and pco2 is equal to 56 then you will write this is respiratory plus metabolic acidosis that is the correct answer then you are asking me sir can i tell it is metabolic acidosis uncompensated no you can't say you can't say that way why because if you look at the change in pco2 what is called delta pco2 that is 56 minus normal 40 by 40 that means the change is by 16 by 40 16 by 40 is how much 0.4 that much is a change okay now if you look at delta bicarb changes now it's 50, it's 16 so 24 is normal minus 16 by 24 that is 8 by 24 which is only 0.3 so who has changed more pc2 has changed more so you have to call it as a respiratory greater than metabolic acidosis this way only you can call it you can't just call it uncompensated metabolic okay so this is the better answer last one is the answer methanol intoxication metabolic acidosis with high anion gap yes high anion gap it is metabolic acidosis with high anion gap and high osmolal gap also okay that's a better answer your osmolal gap is not given so metabolic acidosis with high anion gap diabetes hypertension renal failure oha safe to use lina lina okay I've said this thousand times hypertensive patient develops hba1c of 8.1 patient is on losartan how will you replace this is a very very recent update which Ranjan sir has mentioned, I have mentioned at the end of the slide, Telmisartan has P par gamma agonism. That's what you're studying now. Because of which Telmisartan is slightly better. So the answer is Telmisartan, P par gamma agonism. Normal P par gamma agonist is thiazol and dion. Telmisartan has some P par gamma agonism. Only ARB with P par gamma agonism. I mentioned a line. Okay, that if you remember, otherwise Ranjan sir has taught you this. Which of the following headache requires evaluation? And this signs of dangerous headache, first headache, worst headache with vomiting, with subacute worsening, with pain induced by bending, lifting, coughing, ail, elderly person, immediately getting up because of headache, getting up in the middle of the night because of headache, burst headache, first severe headache, all those things. Now you see, headache with blurring of vision, definitely ICT. New progressive headache, definitely. Burst headache, right. Headache more than 4 hours, why man? When migraine headache lasts more than 4 hours now. So many headaches can last, it's 4 to 72 hours. That is not a big thing. I think BCD, not ABCD. So many people asking me ABCD, no. Headache for more than 4, subacute worsening over weeks is important. It can be a brain tumor. But suddenly for more than 4 hours, it's mostly migraine. Or even tension type headache can last for a long time. It doesn't make it really dangerous. Dangerous headache, these are the findings. And I have again told you so many findings of dangerous headache. You can watch that module. I never said with respect to time. Subacute worsening over days or weeks, brain tumor, correct. Fever manager is correct. Vomiting proceeding headache correct. Induced by bending, lifting, getting up from sleep after 55 years. All that is fine. But not just to 4 hours. So, answer is BCD. It's testing out whether you understood things. We've seen a patient in the OP. If you watch the module on headache and dangerous headache, you'll be definitely able to answer this. Breathlessness, mixedema, shock features. Told you, no? mixedema, comma, question. You can watch the hypothyroid module. H. pylori, once you complete treatment, how do you confirm eradication? I made fun telling that they say stool antigen test is not acceptable by some. This is the best test. But that is not there. So, C13 urea birth test. Always better answer is stool antigen. But stool antigen is not there. So, we go for urea birth test. Diabetic patient with complicated UTA. Whatever it is, complicated UTA. Only three options. That is BLBLI, beta-lactam, beta-lactam is inhibitor. BLBLI, second option. Amicacin, third option. 
okay first option blbl is suprason sulbactam second option is piperacin and tazobactam 4.5 gram iv q6h out of these any three options you can take but any one of the three options you can take but amikacin being nephrotoxy we take this option or this option here piperacin and tazobactam ceftriaxone no role in uti amoxiclav no role in uti nitroferendone is for uncomplicated uti haman crunch sound pneumomedia stain we have discussed that now acute interstitial pneumonia characterized by haman crunch sound of the pneumomedia stain I mean, cut sound. Calibration question is there. I am not sure whether that ECG, nobody can exactly tell me. If it is a bigemini, it means sinus plus VPC. One sinus, one VPC. One sinus, one VPC. That's a bigemini. Or it was a calibration error. Calibration normally, how do you look for? We say 25 millimeters per second, normal calibration. Just to look into the height and the width. Width will be one large box. And height will be two large boxes so this is normal calibration you can look at the end when you see like this is see width is like three large boxes almost and height is like one large box only this is 10 millimeter per second okay this is like width is three large boxes so this is like 50 millimeters per second these two are not generally seen these are the wrong ones or wrongly calibrated when you want to read proper this is the normal calibration please understand that look at the end of the ECG for calibration 25 minutes per second is okay I can myself not checked and learned and checked for calibration this is like calibration will be two 10 millimeters that means two large boxes height one large box width okay when it is like say half of that that is like half standard calibration this is two into standard calibration this is standard calibration only when we are having LVH or massive changes in rate etc we try to change the calibration normally this is the calibration whether it was a calibration error question or a bigemini question I am not sure I think it was bigemini question I feel it is bigemini hearing from what the students have said then they asked about this this is your salt and pepper appearance salt and pepper I have shown you so many images and salt and pepper is seen in diffuse systemic sclerosis correct they have also shown you this image which is your Pathognomonic rash in dermatomyositis, what is Gautran's papule, correct? Violaceous pink flat topped papule on the proximal IP and the metacarpophalangeal. So, it's again Gautran's papule in dermatomyositis. We got a question for all our cause of hypercalcemia except this. Again, a very, very simple question. Hypercalcemia causes can be related to PTH excess, okay? PTH excess can be primary hyperpara, it can be tertiary hyperpara. Always remember, secondary hyperpara is hypocalcemia. Then it can be lithium related. Then there is a disease called FHH. Okay. Then we have PTHRP, which produces low PTH. This is what we see as paraneoplastic, classical squamous cell malignancies. Correct. Then we have increased vitamin D related, increased 125 dihydroxy D3. Okay. With increased 25 means toxicity. With normal 25 hydroxy D3 means somebody is producing this 1 alpha hydroxylase. Seen with sarcoid, lymphoma, acromegaly. Sarcoid, lymphoma, acromegaly. Correct. Miscellaneous causes include Addison, Pheo, thyrotoxicosis. Correct. Then Milkalkali syndrome, which I have discussed specifically. Okay, and then thiazide diuretics. These many causes. You should be there at your fingertips. 100% they will ask you this. Okay, that is hyperpara, hypopara causes. Finally, this question, which I think Krishnamar has also taught you plus and minus here, 1, then plus and minus here, 1, minus and plus here, and yeah, minus and plus. That's it. So I think all of you would know because now first medical contact is a person as per the new guidelines is a doctor knows to connect the ECG leads and needs to know how to interpret a basic ECG and knows how to give a shock. If you don't know this then you are not a doctor as per the new guidelines first medical contact in MI or ACS. So because of which I think all of you would be knowing this and during your MBBS you would have learned this also. So quickly we have actually seen all the questions in both the sessions and what I have understood is if you have studied medicine properly 
then with that you can answer almost all the basics i have actually got in, even more number of questions but we are actually speaking this much are like core relevant to me that's why i'm stopping so another question in microbiology on histoplasmosis is proper like i think with the nodule and those things another question on cryptococcal meningitis again will be discussed in micro like that we have so many 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 questions we start to discuss we can again keep on discussing for hours together so what is the meaning of that medicine is a central point you study medicine everything will happen around it don't see it as a single subject and now again if you feel that okay i don't have time to study i have not studied i have not studied again and again i'm telling you please open the app go to medity every chapter is only 10 hours inside that almost all the important points have been covered we don't have any big case discussions and all those things only important points have been covered inside 80 hours that means a matter of i would say two to three weeks you can complete and you can gain a lot of confidence and this is the confidence i want going to the exam when you discuss this, you see, you know, it's about confidence. Confidence we get by one seeing patients, which is not practical now. But by actually studying a bit more wider, so that these questions we can dissect out and we can have our opinion on, basically. So, that is about INI. So, I think this I need, it's obviously useful because so many of these things will cross overlap. But primarily, it is designed for people who are targeting the next INI. That's a big target because you're having some time with you. You've already given the INI. You know how this exam pattern is. You are in with a very, very good chance. And in the middle, you are having needs. So, Good luck and keep pushing hard and you're almost into the last part. And as always, this part is going to be tough because to hold yourself on with very little time remaining for the exam is tough. But you have to just get over this and there is something obviously better on the other side. So thank you.